Today, before we go into our consideration of judgment in Sinai and where that leads us thematically in, in uh, the prophecy of Daniel, we're going to... and, uh, and so the, the, I think the primary point that I wanted to make, um, there's two primary points off this chapter, and we'll just have to see, is, is um, how current is it if it says... Thus, this is reading, on, on the right side is the ESV, and on the left side is uh, King James. But if it says, thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come. What does that mean to you? Well, I mean, how soon is soon? <laughs> Say, well, to a God that has existed regressively all the way back in infinity of time, Backwards and who will exist all the way in infinity of time forwards, soon could seem a little bit different to us who are but a particle, who occupy but a particle of that time in our lives. So soon is a relative term when God uses it, isn't it? But interestingly enough, that's, I, I don't think really that's what that means here. But it also, there, there's a, uh, uh, this is an echo, or there's an echo that follows in the closing of the book of Revelation, where Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. So it, the, the two appear. We know that when he comes, we're going to have the resurrection and judgment and salvation for all those who have been in faith since Adam, from Adam to the second coming of Christ, will receive salvation. So how soon is soon then? Well, in Revelation, if you look at that word, it has an alternate meaning. And that alter, alternate meaning actually agrees more with what the prophets say about the second coming of, of Christ or the coming of Messiah being suddenly instead of soon. If the word also means suddenly, now all of a sudden it makes perfect sense that 2,000 years have gone by because he said in his parables, in several parables, that he was going to go away for a long time. How soon is a long time? It's not very soon, is it? So he would, would he be contradicting himself? Now he's in heaven, he makes this revelation to the seven churches and he says, I'm going to come, I'm going to roll out what's going to happen between now and when I come. So he rolls it out, prepares them for the coming of a huge false church, and then right at the end of his message, he gives us this final assurance that he's going to come suddenly, which means, although in our time frame, there's no way you can define it as soon, if it happens suddenly, that means then all of his parables kick in and that means we have to be prepared. We can't just be kind of slacking off. We can't look away for a little while, pretend like it's not real because when that sudden event happens, that door is going to be, he's knocking at the door and just like it was in the days of Noah, the door to the ark will be shut. So he gives us warning after warning after warning after warning and many different parables from many different perspectives that we don't know when he's coming, so be ready every day, which corresponds to what Nathan was saying this morning. Let every particle of our faith be a part of our mental makeup. So, <clears throat> here though, what, what sense would that make if this was spoken about 700 years before Jesus said he was coming soon? This is less soon by 700 years it's almost another millennium. This almost goes back three millennia from where we are. So how soon is that? So what's he talking about here? Are we close yet? Nate? I hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, he says, keep justice and do righteousness because my salvation will come. Or soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will will be revealed. Now that's the clue to what he's saying. Because he was obviously to me anyway, maybe it's not obvious, but if you think about it, what this must mean, especially in context of the rest of the chapter, is that Jesus was about to be revealed in, in uh, about 600 years, less than 600 years. And uh, he had just spoken about his sacrifice in the 53rd chapter. He's still on uh, the coming of the Lord his role as, as uh, the Savior, our Savior from sin, and also his role as the Messiah of Israel, which in, as we head toward chapter 60 to 66 in Isaiah, 
this is going to be full to the brim of speaking about Jesus' role as king in the kingdom of God, as it will be in the future. So when he says, blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who holds it fast, that's Christ, who keeps the Sabbath, that's Christ, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil, that's Christ. He's the one that will, will keep justice for the world and do righteousness. And his salvation will come and his righteousness was revealed. God's righteousness was revealed when Jesus um, lived righteously for 33 and a half years. So then what does it say? So he, he's, in other words, he's referencing the coming of Jesus of Nazareth into this world as a representation of God's justice and his righteousness. Okay, that makes sense. And then he describes how he'll do that. So then he says, let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. He said, don't say that. So who's the foreigner who's joined to the Lord? That's you, isn't it? It's Aaron and Abby and Amy and Josh and Sandy. We're all foreigners to Israel. The only way we're connected to the kingdom that will be restored in Israel is by faith. We become sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. But he says, let not that foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people because there is no separation from those of us who are in Christ to the salvation that is of the Jews. No separation. We're grafted on to the nation of Israel. For us, if Israel is ever removed from the sense as being central to our faith, we're, we've made a departure that this is warning Gentiles not to make. And interestingly, he says this, and you'd have to say, if this is a literal eunuch, what on earth does this have to do with what we're talking about here? I believe that the next line in this verse has to correspond to what we're talking about. The coming of Christ, uh, his advent to the Gentile world, and making sure the Gentiles understand they're being grafted into Israel because one day the kingdom of Israel will be restored. So then he says, let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. And when I was reading this this morning, I went, oh, I sure don't have any concept of why he's now bringing up a eunuch, except that that's what Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Jews that were in captivity would need to understand. And they were reading Isaiah and Jeremiah when they were in captivity. But, and they were eunuchs. But what were eunuchs? This is where it gets interesting about us, about you and me. We're not eunuchs. But he says, let not the eunuchs. So I had to look up the meaning of the word eunuch. And it means official in the king's house. So, who are we? Who are the foreigners who are grafted in? There's a house, isn't there? And it's all over the world. There are many venues in it. So let not the officials... That means the people who are, who are attending God's house. It doesn't mean officers in the equipment. I'm not saying that. It means the officials are those people who God has taken away from the world, whose bride, it, whose husband is Christ. So they have no worldly husband. They certainly aren't attracted to the harlot church of this world. They are therefore eunuchs who have not defiled themselves with women, as it says in Revelation. Um, and those women are the false churches of the world. That's who they are in the book of Revelation. So why would he say I'm a dry tree? What, so he's saying, don't say I'm not a part of Israel to us. And he's also saying to us who are a part of his house, watching over the king's house, don't say I'm a dry tree. Well, what, is, what does Babylon offer us? It's just all full of the juices of mortality, the juices of human nature. It's just full to the brim. Nothing dry about the world, its pleasures, its entertainments, uh, the things the world offers us. But what about life in Christ? A little dry? Do you kind of segregate yourself from the world? So let not those people who are officiating in God's house say, I'm a dry tree, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I'll stop right there because I think the point is obvious. This is a metaphor 
of the coming of Christ, his message going out to the Gentile nations, and setting their, their priorities as being a part of Israel, and this is no dry life because you'd be called sons and daughters of the living God. So, how current is soon? In this case, when he says, for soon my salvation will come, um, you notice it says near in the King James on the left column. That means near in time, near in place, or near in relationship. So, for those who are near to Christ in their relationship with him, they're very close to Christ, his salvation will come. And now we have addressed both issues with the use of the word soon, as we commonly understand it. All right, now, uh, let's hope that I didn't um, overlap Nathan too much, but I, you know, like Josh was saying, there's a symbiosis there, so. We'll look for, for uh, um, and a further enhancement of uh, that and many other points that can be made from that chapter. All right, Sinai. You remember, we've been talking about the verses that show that Sinai, uh, that the Bible speaks about the judgment and Sinai and the, the um, composition of this host of people referred to as thousands upon thousands of people, speaks about that frequently in the context of Sinai and the mountains that are in the Sinai Peninsula. And I don't know if you've noticed this yet, but this is a, I don't think I said this so far, this is a Google 3D map um, based on a satellite uh, photograph of the Sinai Peninsula in the area of, the, of Mount Sinai. So what you're looking at is the region where this may well be, you are looking at where the judgment will take place. So you look at that and you go, how is Christ going to have a judgment there? And do I really want to go there? Well, you do if you're going to be made immortal there. And if you're going to meet God at his mountain there. Um, and God now is in, in the person of Jesus. But um, otherwise, you have to have a kind of sense of scale. This is way back. This is satellite view. And it looks like there's no, no place except perhaps right around in here where you could actually have a judgment, and that's close. But as we, we go in, I'm going to zoom in on this, and I'll show you why this, this is kind of interesting in terms of it being a good location for the judgment seat of Christ. Um, and this particular facet of the judgment seat of Christ where there's going to be a separation, you remember reading about this, between sheep and goat personalities. People who were supposed to have faith, who could have uh, taken advantage of faith in their lives, but chose not to for whatever reason um, existed in their minds, and the people who followed Christ in faith all their lives. So there's going to be a separation, and is this a good place for that? Well, well, we'll look at that as we go. But you remember that in Deuteronomy 33, you know, this is just going to be a very quick review because we've got some, several other chapters to, a couple other chapters to cover today. It says that the Lord comes from Sinai, and it says in the latter days. So that's pretty clear that wherever it is, that's where Christ comes from when he, when he has assembled his host, when he begins to act as king. And you also remember that he's described as having hair like wool and eyes like fire and there's lightning coming, emanating from his hands and he's ancient of days. And so that when you get to Daniel 7 verses 9 through 10, the language also says there the court was held and the books were open, the books of life that makes that distinction between the sheep and the goat-like personalities and separates those who were faithful from those who were unfaithful. Um, like our statement of faith says, we believe that there will be a resurrection of the faithful and the unfaithful, namely those who know the revealed will of God and are called upon to submit to it. Faithful and unfaithful in both classes of people, but there at the judgment seat. And, um, and so the language in Daniel is, speaks of thousands upon thousands. It speaks of the Ancient of Days whose hair was, was white and his eyes are on fire and are fiery eyes, which may mean he has judgment in his eyes because fire is used to represent both judgment and life, light and life, um, in many different passages. 
And then we looked at when Christ comes among the churches in his message to the seven churches, he has hair like wool and his eyes are like coals and his face is like shiny bronze and, and uh, all those figures are again repeated and identified with Christ. So when we read in Deuteronomy and we read in Daniel, even though it's not named as, as Jesus, it must be because he's described, he describes himself that way by the use of those figures in the first chapter of Revelation. And we also know that when he was seen in this vision of the transfiguration, with Peter and, and uh, John, and James and John, that it, it, he, he's described the same way. And also um, in the resurrection, the, the, the way he was physically described when he was raised from the dead, it became, literally became the son of God, both in character and in his immortal nature. He had those same attributes. Something about his face like Moses was glowing with the power of God, and, uh, and these descriptions are consistent in every aspect, identifying the person who is doing the judging in Daniel and De Deuteronomy as Christ. Okay. So then we read in Psalm 68 this messianic prophecy of Jesus coming at the end of time. And the language is the same. He comes with thousands and ten thousands. His hair is like wool, his eyes are like on fire, are like coals. There's lightning, there's flashes, there's power, and there's everlasting life offered to the saints. As so much as I'd like to read that whole chapter again right now, because uh, I could almost read it week after week, and here is such a good chapter, we're going to go on to Jude, book of Jude. So let's now go there. This is a theme in this chapter in Jude of ungodly people. So he's now speaking more about goats than he is about sheep. Um, although you can hardly speak about one with making, without making reference to the other. But he says, I want to remind you in verse 5, that although you once fully knew it, Jesus who saved people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroys those who did not believe. So he's talking about saving some and destroying others. And if you think about this literally, the destruction that Jude speak about, speaks about is with such vivid, I almost said colorful, but I don't want to refer destruction as being colorful. It's just not the right word, but it's vivid destruction. It shows the judge, judgmental character of Christ when he comes as Messiah. It is not the sweet Jesus of the Christian world. They just don't have him doing anything except fighting the devil like that. Certainly not people. Um, so he says that he destroyed those who didn't believe. And then he makes a reference to several other, to angels that sinned and to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says these people, um, in like manner, these people also rely on dreams. They defile the flesh. They reject authority. And they blaspheme the glorious ones. Wish I could spend time on this, but it's not really the point to go into the meaning of all the things he's talking about. Then he goes in, in verse 9 into um, this very strange verse about the archangel Michael contending with the devil and disputing about the body of Moses. There's no record of that in the account of Moses' uh, death. We just know that he was taken up to the mountain and he died there. He was not allowed to go into the promised land. But the point is he's speaking over and over about, in the context of ungodliness, uh, about God's work with different sets of people throughout history who were divided some to the left and some to the right. And that's going to follow our theme in the location of the judgment at Sinai. So just hang on and I'll show you how that works out. So he goes on to say in verse 11, Woe to them, they walked the way of Cain. They abandoned themselves for the sake of, uh, for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. What was Balaam's error? He tried to shift the blessing from Israel to Moab. And isn't that what we just were talking about in Isaiah? Don't say I'm a dry tree and don't say uh, I don't have anything to do with Israel. The blessing that God made was upon Abraham and his seed and so salvation is of the Jews. Acts 1 says that when God restores the kingdom, uh, he will restore it to Israel. And the only thing we don't know about that is the day or the hour, the times and the seasons. So that's the... the, 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 the um, 
That's Balaam's error, and the gain involved in Balaam's error was using uh, religion as a means of gain, for, using godliness as a means of gain, which is what priests do, who also take indulgences from, from little missions worldwide. All the, the money of the poor goes to the church. Church is the single richest entity in the world, but nobody knows it. Uh, it's collecting um, millions and millions of dollars every week uh, all over the world. And that's exactly what her daughters do as well. Protestant churches go in and they promise you prosperity as long as you put money in the till. So the, the plates are passed, the money goes in, the, the, the purveyors of these doctrines, of, of Balaam's doctrine, where they're, they're blessing people for gain, they're shifting the blessing from Israel to the blessing of prosperity that goes to the Gentile audience. And the whole thing is all as messed up as Balaam and also in Korah's rebellion. So he's talking about these ungodly people and the distinction between people who, who make errors out of, out of things that should be blessing. And, uh, and there are therefore, in the guise of godliness, ungodly. And in the context of all that, he makes a reference to something that, that Enoch Prophesied. If you go back to Genesis and read about Enoch, it says he, he, he walked with God, but it doesn't really say much about any prophecy that he gave. So if you read into this, you find that um, the prophecy he's referring to, where he says the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. This was a Christian tradition. And it was also must have been a Christian tradition that was derived from a Jewish tradition, and that Jewish tradition could have been derived from some actual prophecy that is no longer extant um, that Enoch made. And if it's true, then this is a reference to something that agrees entirely with what we've been reading in Deuteronomy 33 and Daniel 7, because it says the Lord comes with ten thousands or thousands upon thousands of his saints. That's a reference to Jesus who will be making his judgments with his lightning and his, his flashes, his power, his fiery whirlwinds on the Gentile world. The, 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 these ungodly people who Jude is listing and the way they live, what makes them so ungodly. And why is he coming with 10,000? Why is Yahweh Tzaveop or Lord of hosts or Lord of armies coming with 10,000 of his holy ones? He's coming to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Did you notice the repetition of the word ungodly? Now, ungodly doesn't mean they're not nice guys. They're great men and women. It doesn't mean they're not heroes. It doesn't mean they, they can't say wonderful things and they don't do wonderful things. It just means that they're ungodly. They're without God in this world. Now, why are you without God? You can talk about God day after day all your life and still be ungodly. Because unless you know who Yahweh is, and unless you are close to what Yahweh's message is, you're still ungodly. You may as well carve a pole, stick it out in your front yard, bow down and worship that. You're just worshiping something that you made in your mind or from a tree. Doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. That makes you ungodly. So they, people can look godly, they can talk godly, and still be ungodly because there's no reality about God in their mind. And it, it is obvious, and it also, that it's a broader term than just to say the wicked. And that's because the wicked of this world are the ones that cause all the trouble. There's, a, there's an old saying, that, uh, it's not that old saying, there's a saying that says, there are two kinds of people in this world, horrible people, and miserable people. The horrible people make everyone else miserable. Okay, so you could say that the horrible people are also included in the word ungodly. And those are the armies that do nothing but set fire to cities and destroy these, these men that go to war against one another and destroy each other with violence. Create violence after violence after violence, war after war after war. They are also ungodly. So there's sort of active ungodly and passive ungodly in the context of what he's talking about. And uh, once again, he's, he describes ungodly people as being grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They're loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. 
But then he starts speaking to the, to the sheep and he says, you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord. Um, don't follow ungodly passions. Don't cause divisions. These are worldly people. They're devoid of the Spirit of Christ. Building yourselves up in a holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord that leads to eternal life. And if you're waiting for mercy, that means there's just as much waiting as there is an understanding of having already received it. So there's two parts to, of mercy. The part we receive now and the part we hope for. The part we receive now gives us the peace of Christ. The part we hope for gives us everlasting life at the judgment seat. So once again, there's this judgment seat with a judge who has a fire in his eyes and light. If he looks at you with light, you'll live forever. If he looks at you with fire, you will die in the lake of fire. So, he finishes, he concludes, and I want to, the reason we're spending all summer on this is so that we can get the context of what we're talking about, even though we're not spending a lot of time in Daniel right now. This is all what Daniel is describing when he says, many awake and some stand and some fall. I mean, that's what he's talking about. There's a separation of people who, who were followers and people who were not. People who are godly and people who are not. The only way you can be godly is to be conformed to the image of God's Son because He is conformed to the image of His Father. So, he concludes by saying this, Now to Him who is able, God's hand is not shortened and He is transforming you just as much as you're uh, being transformed by the renewal of your mind. You are His workmanship and He is able like Nathan was opening this morning, to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And that's echoing again a very uh, similar passage to the appellation that are given to Christ when, when we are standing saved around his throne. So, that's Jude, Jude chapter 1, or Jude verse 14, more appropriate. Now what we want to do is take a look at Habakkuk 3, because Habakkuk 3 is also a messianic prophecy that deals with the time of the second coming of Christ. And once again, it's not gonna, we're not going to get the same benefit out of it if we just take the verse. So, once again... Let's take a look at the whole chapter. And see what it says about, uh, that correlates to what we're thinking about. And that is, general point, Sinai is where Christ comes from, where he had the judgment. So it's a prayer of Habakkuk, according to Off, I guess. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So, we're not going to talk about the midst of the years today. I'd like to, but that's saved for a later time. We're going to come back to this. But he's saying that Christ's work is going to be revived in the midst of the years. Just in short, I'm not going not gonna to get into why I say this, just in short, Christ's work consists of seven years. It's a week of years, or seven years. He spent three and a half years, the first time he was here, doing that work, dealing with sin on a, on a personal level. He's going to come back, and there's going to be a three and a half year period in which he operates as Messiah, and then there are many periods associated with his second coming, there's going to be one three and a half year where his work will be complete. And somehow or another, I believe, and we'll talk about this later, that the second three and a half year period completes that week of years. And Daniel, this is referred to in Daniel, it's called the seventh heptate or the seventh seven year period of seven seven year periods. Um, that sounds like a mouthful, but I think you get it. So, he says, in wrath, remember mercy. In other words, when Christ comes, 
and he comes to, to and his work is revived in this world dealing with sin on a global level it will be in wrath that he remembers mercy so there's two components operating in Christ as judge and in Christ as king wrath and mercy wrath on one hand mercy on the other wrath on the left mercy on the right wrath for the goats Mercy for the sheep, wrath for the wicked of this world, mercy on all those who inherited lies from their fathers. The rest of the population that would become the mortal population uh, receiving the mercy of God in the kingdom. There's a huge number of people. We don't know how many. Um, and that's contrasted in the book of Revelation to the slain of the Lord, which will be from one end of the earth to the other. So there's going to be a lot of people experiencing God's wrath when he comes. And there are going to be a lot of people experiencing God's mercy when he comes. Mortals who are not made immortal at the judgment seat of Christ. They'll just, they're going to say, surely our fathers have inherited lies. They're going to bend the knee to Christ and his authority. Every eye will see him and they will be very, very glad to now understand that God is, is indeed with us. But then it says, in that context of the second coming of Christ and this division between wrath and mercy that God, or Christ operating as God's representative in, in the world when he comes, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Think about that, that's what Selah means. His splendor covered the heavens, that is the political climate of this world, and the earth was full of his praise. That is the time when he completes his work of subjecting the nations to his authority. And the earth will be full of his praise. There's no question this is talking about Christ's role as judge and king in this world. But it says he came from Teman and Paran. So you have to look at a map to do this. And I don't have one. Um, but Teman and Paran are there en route from Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula as you go northward toward Israel, which is where he will take that host of people that he will use to judge the armies when he brings them against Jerusalem to battle. So this is talking about that and it is placing it in the Sinai Peninsula. If he originates, if the judgment originates at Mount Sinai, um, Teman and Perrin are on the way uh, to Jerusalem. So it says his bright, and again he's being described here with the same language that we read about in Habakkuk, in Daniel 7, in Deuteronomy 33, in Revelation 1, at the Transfiguration, and all these other places, his brightness was like the light rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. So if his brightness is like light, that means he has the, um, the power of God, which is in fire and light, in his visage. And rays flash from hand, his hand like lightning, what that says is that he has power and authority now to use his power to take control of mankind. And think of what language men use to understand that they are being taken control of. They use fire and light. Only they use it destructively. He's going to use it um, selectively in this division of judgments that he makes. Before him, it says, went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. So there's going to be natural uh, disasters that will take some people out. He stood and measured the earth. That is, he quantified this. And I, I believe that inherent in that is judgment in that measuring. And inherent in that also is the the kind of measuring that you would do when you appreciate the fact that God has given you the earth and everything that there is. He measured the earth. He considered the fullness of his inheritance first through Abraham and Israel and then um, God's promise, ask of me and I will give you the ends of the earth for your possession, as it says in Psalm 2. Um, so he measured the earth. He shook the nations. Not only is he going to shake them and wake them up, but he's going to shake them literally with an earthquake, these nations that come against Israel to battle. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sank low. His were everlasting ways. You know what I love about this? 
the detail. The detail means there is no question this is true. It's in the detail, and it's in the prophetic detail more than anywhere else that this is true. So verse 8, was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation? So that's a kind of a rhetorical question, which could mean, are you angry with the earth or are you angry with its people? Are you angry with the, the men and women of this world who are ungodly or are you angry with their dominions? Because their dominions are going to be the inheritance of Christ and the saints. The whole world belongs to Christ. If it belongs to Christ, it belongs to those that are his at his coming. So it could also mean, is your wrath against the peoples of this world, because they are the seas and their rivers. You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on, and the deep gave forth its voice. It lifted hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You, so there's a marching here of a military commander who has a host of people with him and who is judging the earth in fury. You threshed the nations, speaking of things that have not yet happened, as though they were. You threshed the nations in their anger. You went out for the salvation of your people. And what this means is, he came out of his role as an unknown thief in the house where nobody knew him. He comes out now as the Messiah of Israel, as the king of this world. He's acting as king and... He went out for the salvation of that remnant. His people are the Jewish people, that remnant. You, and then it says, you crushed the head of the house of the wicked. What does that remind us of? You crushed the head. Anybody got a, want to venture a guess? You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. What does that remind you of? He shall bruise your heel, but you will bruise his head. You will, and bruise there means crushed. So here he's saying, you're going to take the serpent and its influence in mankind and the armies of this world and the governments and politics and philosophies and educations of this world, that serpent which dominates mankind with the sting of death, and he's going to crush his head. He did it on the cross, but that was cross was also sort of more where the serpent bruised his heel, right? Took him out for a little bit, but didn't kill him. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors. So that's a literal, a literal description of the metaphor of crushing, bruising the head of the, the serpent. Who came like a whirlwind to scatter me. That is, this, this enemy of Israel, all these armies came like a whirlwind to scatter Israel. And God is referring to Israel as me. Rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. They were, they were happy to do it. They were giddy with the idea that they were going to annihilate Israel. You trample the sea, that is, all the, this sea of soldiers with your horses surging of mighty waters. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones and my legs tremble beneath me because of the, the terror of Christ's power when he asserts it against the ungodly of this world. It will be equivalent to, but I think more dramatic than, if you could say this, than the terror that occurred when the door to the ark was shut, the floodwaters came, and, and the major population of the world, with the exception of eight little people, was, was drowned in place. You picture the terror of that event. We don't want to be outside the ark. Uh, I'll tell you what my dad used to say to me in 1968, uh, 67, 68 in that winter before I got baptized in April, 50 years ago. Uh, he started, I think, in August. And he, and he just comes up to me one day, passed me by in a hall in the house, and he says, better get in the boat. 
So when I made it very clear to him that that was how I felt about my baptism, I was baptized in April. And like I said, that was 50 years ago. What happened to time? 50 years. So I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Yet I will quietly wait. I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. And this is this sad picture of Israel in the time of, of judgments. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be in the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the field yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the, store, in the stalls. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like a deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. All right, one more series of, of um, where this goes very quickly. Again, in the clefts, you can see that there are clefts of rocks there. Song of Solomon, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Rise up in the resurrection, O oh, my dove, my, my beautiful bride. This is, this is the language of romance. In the cleft of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. Where, when we look into his eyes, in that moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will receive his life and be immortal. Our bodies will be changed in an instant, just like that. There's the resurrection and the judgment, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, that is, Christ comes as judge first, and it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? This occurs in Sinai at the judgment, and it occurs as he goes out as Lord of hosts. So look at the crosshairs there. That's actually Mount Sinai. The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand when a fiery... What did that say? A fiery commission for them, or a fiery purpose of judgment. Oh God, when you went forth, you notice we're getting closer. Before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook, and the heavens dropped down at the presence of God, and even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. When you went forth before your people, and when you marched through the wilderness, the Lord gave the world the word, there's a command in heaven. There's a trumpet. He sends his angels. They resurrect the dead. Great was the company of those that published this command, this command of, of peace, who publishes peace, who saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. With a mighty chariot tree, twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands, the Lord came from Sinai into the holy place. So this is a close-up picture of where this is. You don't know how many people, but there's room for hundreds of thousands of people on either side. And what's most interesting to me is the topography. I mean, it could go back in here. This is all sort of, was kind of developed, but it's abandoned now. There's, there's not too many people here, and I'm sure God will arrange for this to be private when the time comes, if this is where it is. It's going to need to be private because he's as a thief in the house at that point. But look at the, the topography. There's a division, and God is in between two valleys. What if, and I'm just saying what if, what if the sheep are on one side, those who have found favor with God, and they are alone with Christ, because all the goat-like personalities, those people who chose to reject Christ, are over there on the other side of God's mountain to be sent away, cast out. This is to me, looks like it is perfectly set up to cast people out in a, in a segregation of types. What if? I don't know. We'll find out. The bottom line here is, this seems to be suited to the judgment as it's described. It's in Sinai. It's in the Sinai Peninsula. And this is at the point at which we are taken to be with the Lord forever.